Mai Lakmia, to got white. Bonjour tout le monde. Runa Simit. Go away to Hoba. Woman to Hinshang Lenyman. Silma Hemen. Paz e felicidade a todos. Audi Diano. Hello, space enthusiast. You're tuned into Space Forward. Get ready to embark on an interstellar expedition to explore the latest, inspiringly awesome ideas with forward-thinking space visionaries. We're your host, Hussein Bukhari. And Kelly Kowalski. In this episode, we talk to team members from the International Space University's Space Studies Program about their team project to design a durable and decipherable message for an intelligent species elsewhere in the cosmos. Anything that helps us think about ourselves and our, our place in the universe and what it means to be human, what we're doing to our planet and how our species might exist in more galactic timescales, I think that's a very positive exercise. You know, we all get so caught up in our, our daily lives, like, oh, what am I going to have for breakfast? So what job am I going to have in five years? You know, really, when you start thinking about creating a message that's going to be found by extraterrestrials in a hundred million years, all these little things start to melt away and you realize, oh, you know, we're all kind of on this rock together. We're all just kind of searching for these very basic answers. Like, are we, are we alone? Is this it? Or are there other beings on other rocks, thousands of light years away, having these exact same discussions? Stay tuned as we reveal a few songs that listeners suggested to encode on a new golden record. But first, our latest transmission, episode 13, encoding a new golden record with ISU's Eternal Echo Team. Namaste. Hello from the children of planet Earth. So apparently we Earthlings have been trying to talk to aliens for quite some time. And back in the 19th century, Carl Gass, the mathematician, wanted to sculpt a massive right triangle into the Siberian landscape. Oh, yeah. You mean the Pythagoras theorem? Yeah. A triangle large enough to be seen on the moon. And then Marconi came along. Yeah. The guy who's credited for inventing radio technology, right? Yeah. That Marconi. So according to a New York Times article that was published in 1919... Marconi blasted a radio signal into the cosmos, hoping to contact some kind of extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm assuming that the signal's frequency didn't get past our ionosphere. Probably. But it did launch SETI, or communications with extraterrestrial intelligence. I thought it was SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, it was SETI with a C, because Carl Sagan, one of SETI's founders... He just really loved that the acronym had a Latin root for cetaceans or whales, which pretty much have their own form of communication that is alien to us. But in this episode, we're mostly talking about Medi, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, Medi. And we are talking to some of our colleagues from the International Space University, which has a program every summer where participants are tasked with tackling a group project um, in a relatively short space of time. Uh, And this group was tasked with creating an updated interstellar message. Right. Uh, They were tasked with creating uh, Golden Record 2.0. But the original Golden Record... Well, it was a gold-plated copper disc encoded with a message about us Earthlings and put on board the Voyager space probes, which were launched in the late 70s. Yeah, and uh, now they're hurling through interstellar space, along with their predecessors, Pioneer 10 and 11. Yeah, interstellar space. So let's take it away with our International Space University compadres, Guillaume, Yana, and Paul. Well, so we're here today talking about an exciting project that you guys have all wrapped up at uh, the International Space University during your space studies program, um, and you call the project the Eternal Echo. You know, talk to us a little bit about you know where the name actually came from. 
So the name Eternal Echo, it just it had a ring to it. And we also really were focusing on this idea of eternity because anything that you you know send into space is going to be there for a long time uh the probability of it you know having a collision is extremely low and as long as the materials are durable enough it's going to last for millions and millions if not billions of years so long after you know we've come and gone as a species in all probability so we wanted our message to be something that we wanted to like speak for us into eternity and we knew that whatever we would say would just be an echo of who we are. So that's where the name Eternal Echo came from. So really, for people who don't know, maybe you could give a little background to Voyager and how you guys decided to do it differently or the same. So uh, the Voyager mission, uh, well, the, the golden record that was on the Voyager mission was a follow-up to the uh, plaques that were put on the Pioneer mission. These are the, the four missions, the two Pioneers and the two Voyagers, were all missions uh, intended to briefly explore the outer planets, um, and then they were already on an interstellar trajectory, so they left the solar system. When it was realized that these missions were going to leave the solar system, a small group of people, including including Frank Drake and Carl Sagan, realized that there was some possibility of this, this vehicle being intercepted by another intelligence. And given that tiny possibility, they considered it to be worth putting a message from humanity to this hypothetical receiver. The, the first attempts on the, the Pioneer missions were a simple plaque with an engraving. It, it was reasonably straightforward, but not without its controversy. On Voyager, um, Frank Drake came to the genius realization that the plaque was about the same size as a, a long playing record, a, a vinyl record that was popular at the time. So he decided, or he suggested that instead of just putting a simple plaque on Voyagers, they could put a record in containing uh, a lot more than just simple pictorial information. It also managed to include over an hour of sound and music, and uh, they also encoded a whole bunch of images of, of different things onto the, the record as well. So given that background, there's, there's only been one interstellar mission since then, and that is or one, one mission with an interstellar trajectory, that is New Horizons. And um, the principal investigator on New Horizons decided against putting a similar kind of message on that spacecraft uh, because he didn't want to detract, uh, he, did, he didn't want to take away from the, the science goals of the mission. They did put some cultural artifacts on there. There's a small sample of the ashes of the guy that discovered Pluto and a, a, you know, some stamps and coins and things are on that mission, but nothing in the, the sort of the, the, the message sense of what we, we had previously uh, and what we as the Eternal Echo team were trying to reproduce in a modern way. So what we decided to do differently was look into all of the possible technologies we were aiming to have a similar kind of inert payload on an existing interstellar mission. So we weren't uh, focused on building the mission itself, but just adding our message to an existing mission. Um, the, the payload had to be completely independent. It couldn't affect the primary mission, whatever the science goals of that mission were. So we were limited in what we could do. We couldn't use any power. It had to be you know, stable uh, and able to protect itself from its environment. And so we looked into a lot of possibilities, and, uh, and in the end, we ended up coming to a lot of the same conclusions that they had come to 40 years earlier. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, what were those conclusions that you came up to that they had come to 40 years earlier? The, the main conclusion that you know, we came to that they also came to uh, was that the, the, the best way to encode information is inscribed matter. You know, we looked into a lot of other options, you know, di different types of optical storage and you know, encoding information into the atomic structure of crystals and, and all sorts of you know, fancy technologies that do exist on Earth today um, and can be you know, created in laboratory situations. But none of them had the, the stability and durability for the you know, hundreds of millions or hopefully billions of years of, of travel time that we're looking for. What did you say? Inscribed material? So the, the information is encoded onto our artifacts uh, as deformations in the surface. So we start with a, a perfectly flat 
clean um, you know, gold disc, which is similar to the, the records um, Sagan used, but onto this gold disc, uh, we're etching material on etching information onto one side, which was similar to what they did with the, the cover of their golden record. And on the other sides, we're etching high density digital information. Um, so we've got, uh, I guess, a- analogous to the way that information is encoded on a CD, you've got you know, the changes in the surface of the of the metal, which can be uh, re- recovered using the appropriate technology. Were there any new things that you that you brought to Eternal Echo that were different somehow to what Sagan and the peers had done on the record? I think where we diverge the most is in our ideas for the content of the message itself. And we also included updated versions of the Pulsar map that was on the original Golden Record, of courtesy of radio astronomer Scott Ransom. And we decided to include a more detailed map of our location in the galaxy via those pulsar maps and also a logarithmic map of our galaxy. But in terms of the philosophical approach, we really can't speak for all of humanity or define all of humanity in one single way. So we decided that the best way to capture us was to actually find a way to express individuality of experience. And I described it in uh, a kind of idea I call the paradox of humanity, is that we are all the same in that we're all so different. Well, you know, I did watch your uh, presentation and the beginning, I thought it was really cool. You guys had a map of the world and you represented every person in the, the team that worked on this where you were located on that map. And it was a very tiny percentage in a tiny area when you consider the entire globe. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about that and maybe a little bit about how this uh, project was brought together by you guys as a team. Sure. The project was part of the International Space University's Space Studies Program uh, for 2021. The The Space Studies Program is something that the ISU does every year. It's in a different place every year, and it usually involves around 120 people, uh, participants from all over the world. Uh, so we had you know, 17 people working with us on the team project. So the, the team was mostly for, of uh, Western European uh, extraction, so you know, people uh, across Western Europe, and you know, you know, I, I consider myself to be you know, culturally Western European, even though I'm Australian. We had nobody from Africa, we had nobody from Asia, you know, we had nobody from South America. We did have uh, a Canadian, so there was you know, a, a token person from, from that continent. And you know, we were aware of that, and so you know, being aware of of our limitations uh, meant that we were able to, you know, acknowledge them. And we went through f- philosophical discussions about whether it would even be okay to try. But, uh, yeah, in the end, we decided to, to, to use what we had and what we knew and open up the possibility for other people to voluntarily contribute at some point down the line. How did you guys interact on a day-to-day basis uh, without kind of going into some crazy philosophical tunnel rabbit hole or without wringing your your hands and and getting frustrated with the universe? How did you cope with all of that uh, working as a, a, a rather big team in a sense? At the beginning, I was like, oh, it will be a mess. But it wasn't a mess at all. Everybody knew precisely where he could put an insight in the project. Sometimes we did, we had to debate, but I remember precisely one time that I was so sure that we should use, uh, we um, use 5D crystal to encapsulate a message. Um, and then Paul came to me and he came to me. He was like, uh, Guillaume. Um, can you just have two minutes for me? And I know when, that when Paul said that, he will crush my dreams in a few words. Uh, this is exactly why we called, we called him the dream crusher. And it just explained to me that th- th- this is quite cool, but uh, the message won't last more than centuries. So, okay, no problem. I just send the group in, in a bad direction 
and I know now that this was a bad direction, so let's go to, to God plate. It's always a good thing to listen to the people that know better than you. And in the group, there was always someone that knew better than you knew. <laughs> So uh, we had this very flat organization and we um, managed to uh, take the best of each person with every voice being heard. Because I think that uh, in my personal experience, if one, verse, one voice is not heard, this is exactly where you can lose the big ideas. I guess what's interesting, too, is that is you had an, a, a larger number of people than, say, a few folks like Carl Sagan and uh, Drake himself. And that, that could cause problems or not problems. And maybe I think my question really is, is leaning towards representation um, and how you folks tried to address that on some level. I mean, was it fair for Voyager just to have the few people who make up those messages that we would actually send to another intelligence potentially. How do you guys feel about that? And, and how did you try to address that in this project itself? Okay, so we had an in-depth discussion about this with Nadia Drake. And she explained it to us that really at the time, it was not quite spur of the moment, but it might as well have been this devising of the content of the golden record and it was a group of people that were just very excited and passionate about creating a message for aliens and I don't think that this idea of should we be the people who are going to represent all of humanity came up it was that well we are the people who have the ability to do this and the uh, inclination towards it so this was something that we had to confront, like, okay, what can we do within the scope of the summer? This was our challenge. Like, how do you make a message that can represent all of humanity? And we decided for us, and maybe for anyone, it's kind of impossible. It's not just humanity that we had to represent. It was also like, how do we feel about our sense of place in the universe? And how do we think of ourselves outside of being humans? While also analyzing what it means to be a human being, because when you're trying to think about how you're going to communicate ideas to extraterrestrials, you have to think outside the lens of what it means to interact with reality in this way, in this physical form. So Yana mentioned the science journalist Nadia Drake, who happens to be the daughter of Frank Drake, the guy who engineered the golden record um, along with uh, Carl Sagan. And don't forget the same Drake who formulated the Drake equation. Yeah, the Drake equation, which is a theoretical equation designed to estimate the probability of life and intelligence elsewhere in the universe. Sorry, and you were talking about Nadia Drake. Right, so I guess Nadia talked to the team about her dad and the making of the original Golden Record, but as it so happens, she is also married to Scott Ransom, the radio astronomer who has created an up-to-date Pulsar map. Right, because when Drake designed the old Pulsar map on the Pioneer and Voyager probes, we had only discovered a small number of pulsars. Right, and for anyone who does not know what a pulsar is, here is the basic breakdown as I understand it. You have a star, a massive one, it explodes into a supernova, leaving only its ghostly crushed core, which is now a neutron star. But some of these uh, stars rapidly spin and they create these sweeping beams of uh, light, sort of like a lighthouse, um, that for the purposes of our pulsar map can serve as a sort of lighthouse beacon to help pinpoint where we are in the universe. Yeah. And now we've found a lot more pulsars as well as millisecond pulsars, which spin faster, longer, and have companion neutron stars. And so Scott used those millisecond pulsars on his updated map because they last more like billions of years rather than a mere million. So I'm not sure if you know this, he's saying, but space is rather large. I had an inkling. And so the likelihood of our very teeny tiny small interstellar probes being scooped up by some intelligence is near zilch. Well, as Paul mentioned, it's an exercise to think through these concepts. So let's find out how the team consolidated their mission and how their message diverged from the original golden record. The beginning of the project was very, very open. Like there was you know, 
many infinity times and approaches that we could have taken. It was it was huge and vast and never ending. The philosophical discussions we had at that time were just as big. So we we realized reasonably quickly that we were going to have to 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 put some fences around the project and sort of define some some boundaries uh, as to what we could actually achieve within the the time period that we had. Uh, so what we uh, the conclusions that we came to on that front were that we were going to design something or, or come up with a recipe for something that could be built today using technology that exists. Um, and could be put onto an interstellar mission as an inert payload. And also, it, just in terms of our methodologies for how we, we dealt with all these uh, big questions and challenges and huge ideas, because really, there was a point in the project, I think it was when we watched this film, The Farthest, which is a documentary about the Voyager missions and the original Golden Record. We felt so out of our depth. I, I remember like people were crying after the movie because we were like, how are we going to make something that's better than this? <laughs> I felt very like emotionally moved and uh, I felt very passionate, but also like, whoa, this is a huge undertaking. And when it came to what we actually ended up deciding for the message itself, we needed to include a description of where we are. So that uh, was described using the updated millisecond pulsar map as devised by Scott Ransom. And also we decided to include a logarithmic map of the galaxy because we felt it was important for us to show a description of our place and also the extent to what we understand about our galaxy because because on the original Pioneer plaque it wasn't included, but there was this pictorial description of the the solar system but scale wise is quite inaccurate so this is why the logarithmic map was more useful and then when it came to the higher levels of the message we decided we wanted to include information about the biodiversity of earth so that's why we decided to include the phylogenetic tree and imagery connected to uh, our genomes and our chromosomes the amount of data in our chromosomes and also pictures of different forms of life. But another important thing that we decided to include in the message that was uh, an idea contributed by our team member Stasha was the description of time because the original Golden Record didn't really allude to the time scales we experience on Earth and the lifespan of human beings. So he came up with a really nice diagram that shows the birth death cycle of a uh, human life and then the kind of the reproduction point and then how that turns into another birth death cycle of a human being and then that was contrasted to the life cycle of a star but obviously the time frames are vastly different and i thought that was a really nice concept to have included on our message because time is something that we're all bound to and it really defines what we do with this existence so essentially you guys thought about who we are where we are and when we are when we are and also what we are and what we feel that's the other big thing we decided to include that i haven't got into because it's a, a huge topic uh but how are we going to put art on this thing? I was really confounded by this challenge because art is something that's obviously really important to the human experience. Otherwise, we wouldn't be producing so much of it. But how do you include art? Because to an extraterrestrial, it's not going to have any context or meaning. It might as well be random noise if you just put the Mona Lisa. And I thought, okay, we could put the brain activity of someone experienced a really deeply personal piece of art. We could include different experiences from a whole range of people. We didn't decide necessarily on the selection mechanism. That's the open part of it. So we're not the ones getting to create the art. It's like a, it's a personal choice, but it's still an idea in development, but that's definitely the direction we wanted to go in to actually convey intimate individual experience on this and uh, the individuality of consciousness and the individuality of everyone's experiences rather than 
just having something that's static and impersonal. You you mentioned something about um, feeling the weight after watching The Farthest. I actually haven't seen The Farthest. Hussein, have you seen The Farthest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I have. I definitely felt those waves and also a few tears too. So I, I'm definitely going to have to check it out. But one thing I, I came across while reading about the project um, is something that Frank Drake said, and I just have to read it to you all now because I was pretty inspired reading this. And Frank Drake is one of the original guys who was part of the sending the message out uh, on Voyager, right? Am I, am I right about that, Hussein? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> I was like, what? hello? Yes, um, absolutely. I'm making sure you're still yeah. here. Yeah. I'm still so, here. Uh, here's the quote. Um, this was actually done, uh, I guess, uh, not so long ago at Cornell University um, at the Carl Sagan uh, Center, uh, where they celebrated the Voyager mission. And he says about the golden record that it turned out to be one of the most beautiful events in my life. We all had the sense that we were doing something very important. We would create a record of existence of our civilization that would last longer than the earth itself. It might never be found, but if it did, it would be the only thing in the universe that would have recorded memories of the history of this civilization. And that weighed heavily on us, but also inspired us. So I don't know if you were alone in, in feeling the heavy weight of this, but here's a question for you guys. Why, why do you think this topic became, I mean, International Space University creates a lot of topics every summer for people to research. And usually it's about a topic that is kind of um, indicative of the times. For example, last year it was uh, about how space technology monitors and mitigates pandemics, global pandemics. But in this case, um, why do you think they chose this topic about the Golden Record 2.0? I think right now as a society, we're faced with a lot of existential questions. We're being faced with the threats of a pandemic. We're being faced with threats of climate change. And I think more and more we're seeing how our civilization is becoming increasingly unsustainable. And we have some foresight, probably not enough, but we can kind of see the writing on the wall and that if we don't make some radical changes we're not going to be successful as a species for much longer. We are very, very, very focused nowadays on what divides us. And as a species, th this is a chance for us to, exactly as an astronaut, explain the overview effect as you see no borders from the ISS. This is a chance for us to see no borders, no, differ no real difference between us and us to all humanity what we have in common, send it to space. This is almost symbolic. I think it's important right now because we're coming to these realizations that we don't have infinite growth and we need to create some kind of record of us because we're not eternal. You know, everything we're experiencing right now is transient and all species inherently are transient. We're all going to evolve into something else. So if we can create something and put it into deep space where it's going to go on for eons and eons, it's funny, we talked a lot about the human audience for this, and the only audience we know that is ever definitely going to see this is us, but also probably the most likely audience, uh, aside from us right now, is um, ourselves in the future. So I think it's really important for us to take the time to evaluate where we are now and where we are going. It's, it's a message in a bottle in some ways, but it's also a time capsule. It's interesting challenge from a philosophical and psychological perspective of human psyche and debating that as human species. But what about like the technical and engineering difficulties? Maybe you guys want to talk a little bit about that. During the, uh, the, the process of exploring what we were going to do and how we were going to build it, uh, we looked into a lot of different technologies that, that had promise of being able to store vast amounts of data um, you know, it, it, at one point we were we were looking at technologies that could hold you know, many, many petabytes of data, and you know, going to try and put all of Wikipedia on this thing. And we had a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of different things that we did look into. Uh, most of these were eliminated for technical reasons. You know, they they didn't have the durability we needed, or the manufacturing process was only possible in you know, laboratory conditions at a few universities in the world. So in the end, what we, the 
the model that we came up with is you know, two pure gold discs. The discs are two millimeters thick each. On the outer surfaces of these discs, we have the information engraved that um, Aina was talking about earlier. Um, and on the inside of these discs, uh, we have the high density information being etched into the surface. Um, this is the same kind of etching that happens, you know, that is common in the semi um, semiconductor industry. You know, these, these are technologies that are you know, very mature and very well established um, and not necessarily particularly difficult to do. Uh, around on the on the outside of these two discs, we had a few layers of aluminium, which were acting as uh, shields against high velocity impacts, dust impacts, or micrometeorites. Yeah, in in the interstellar space uh, between the stars, there's there's a reasonable chance of some of these impacts being relativistic, and. Uh, if the um, artifact was just exposed uh, to that environment, that it, it would be you know, chipped away reasonably quickly and any information that was on it would, would no longer be there. We also took into consideration uh, diffusion you know, over, over these timescales. You know, all matter tends to break down and, and you know, disintegrate. And uh, we chose gold because it was you know, one of the most resistant to this kind of erosion, to this, this this kind of disintegration, but you know, there's nothing that is impervious to this. So what we had to do to counteract that was make the um, the physical features on the surface large enough that they would you know, that they would have a longer life. Uh, we had them too small, too fi too fine a detail. Uh, the the um, data would be would be gone re relatively quickly. So the, these are the, the kinds of you know, technical challenges that we faced. And in the end, we ended up coming to, to a situation that is not actually technically difficult yeah, by, by t uh, c contemporary standards, which was a, a surprise to, to most of us. It's not where I thought we'd go from the beginning. We were inspired also by um, a really amazing Mexican space artist named Nahum. And he gave us this uh, lecture on kind of the artistic process and there was a quote he he left us with that uh stuck in our heads and it was think analog not digitally uh <laughs> so um we kind of kept that in mind you guys have now in your uh thought uh process with the internal echo figured out what you're going to put on this thing and what the actual material is so how do you get it out and then two what happens if it gets received? Okay, so for, for question one, um, we we looked into a, a lot of different di different options. Uh, we looked into all of the uh, missions that have interstellar trajectories that are public knowledge from from all of the you know, major agencies around the world and also private activities. We came up with a. You know, a short list of the ones that seemed to be most likely to be possible, and uh, these are there, there was a a um, Chinese mission, interstellar mission that's due for for, for launching you know, within a few years. It's it's actually very soon. There's an ESA proposal for an interstellar mission. Uh, NASA has a few proposals. The one of those that seemed the most likely uh, so far was. An, an Alpha Centauri mission that is that is um, intended to be launched on the hundredth anniversary of the moon landing, uh, and then of course there's Breakthrough Starshot as well. So for the you know, institutional type of missions, we basically provide a recipe for how to create this kind of artifacts um, to put on their missions. You know the the content, the actual content that goes onto it, uh, you will be updated constantly. You know you. Humanity is in a, in a constant state of flux. You know, things that are relevant to people today won't be relevant tomorrow. Just as the things that that were proposed in you know the seventies and were launched in the seventies are not particularly relevant to us today. We yeah we came up with a recipe that that could be um, you know, easily adapted to these kinds of missions. Uh, for breakthrough, uh, the the time frame we're looking at there is you know they're not planning or they're not expecting to be able to launch within fifty years. So it was kind of it was it was it was essentially looked at as a, a back burner option. It was you know 
something that you know, we could adapt the project, uh, remove the the physical aspect of it, and just include the content into their their, their chipsets. Um, and you know, it, it, we we still have the the flexibility within the design to to be able to do that. And the second part of the question: uh, What happens if the if it actually is received by an extraterrestrial intelligence? So we we used uh, yeah, and again we looked into lots of alternatives, but we we ended up coming back to the same conclusion that you know, Sagan and Drake did. The artifact has uh, a map of the galaxy um, you know, with two different types of maps of the galaxy: the pulsar map and the logarithmic map, um, to show where the uh, mission was launched from and when. The, the pulsar timing uh, actually gives a very good uh, timestamp of the, the time of launch as well. Uh, so uh, any um, extraterrestrial intelligence that's capable of you know, receiving this artifact uh, has to be able to, to do so while the mission is in cruise. You know, they have to be able to match velocity with the, the probe, you know, it, take the probe in, get the artifact off, pull it apart and, and, and to get to the information that's stored on it. This, this is something that, that we can't do at the moment. You know, if, if, even if we were to see a, a, an interstellar probe from another species coming through the, the solar system at the moment, there is no way that we could catch up with it. So this, you know, any recipient technology has to be, or say any recipient species has to be technologically superior to where we are at the moment. Um, so we gave them an address of where we were, where we were at the time we launched it, and we also gave them the twenty one centimeter hydrogen line, um, which is the, the same um, frequency that that Sagan used. Um, in addition to the other ways that we represented the hydrogen line or the twenty one centimeter hydrogen spin flip, uh, we also made the discs twenty one centimeters in diameter. So there's there's an extra clue in the pure shape of the of the artifacts as to you know, what the the frequency that we're talking about is now the 21 centimeter line is astronomically uh, very interesting it's it's a, a line that has been it was a spectral band that has been uh, observed extensively since radio astronomy you know, first started um and it continues to be observed extensively, and I, I can't imagine any reason that it's ever going to change into the future. Essentially, we've given them a, a phone number with the you know, the location, you know, the pin code to get through to the the, the right extension, you know, on the artifact. Th there's there's not going to be any receiver within the next you know ten million years, maybe more. So we won't be here to receive, but if humanity still exists at that point and they're still doing radio astronomy, they'll hear the, hear the response. Wait, I have a follow-up question. What is this hydrogen thing? Yeah. It's the lowest energy emission from a single hydrogen atom. It's basically an electron uh, changes its orientation and, and, and flips back. And when it flips back, uh, it releases a, a very defined uh, type of radiation. This radiation has a very specific wavelength, which is just over 21 centimeters. And uh, because this is such a fundamental uh, physical property of the universe, it's something that you know any species that is doing astronomy is going to be observing this line. Got it. It, it should be obvious to them. <laughs> well, that's, and that's a big if, right? It, it should be obvious if they are. <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's kind of my point is that we're assuming a lot. This is simply on the basis of what we know, and what we know could could essentially have a lot of holes in it. So, do you think it's the best way to do this, or do you believe that this is the only way that we could do this with what we have now? Yeah, I, I think with you, with the restriction of today's technology and the restriction of uh, not coming up with our own interstellar mission, uh, this is the best that you can do at the moment. I am very confident in saying that. And, and in terms of its ability to survive the environment, do you think it's that you guys have built a robust enough strategy? Uh, there's, there's no guarantees, but we have uh, we've tried to give you know enough. Uh, redundancy in the design uh, and enough protection that uh, it should be safe from most of the likely possible things that could go wrong with it. 
you know, we, the the proposal makes uh, says that the artifact should be on the trailing edge of uh, any spacecraft so that it doesn't have, you know, this, it has a, a lesser chance of, of impacts. Um, it's still not a, a zero chance of impacts, but we've also got shielding on it. We have the um, the data that is etched on the inside of the disks is going to have uh, redundancy in it as well. Data is going to be etched a, a number of times. We didn't quite narrow down that number, but uh, you know, the, the idea is that there's, there's there should be, even if only part of the artifact survives, there should be enough uh, information left that uh, that an intelligent species could extract and start to understand what's encoded. But the probability and the risk associated with sending out one versus many is significantly large. So how do you how do you uh, how do you differentiate that you know the risk of failure of this project even on board somebody else's? asset or somebody else's spacecraft it still still remains high you know why not why not adopt a different approach of volume and send out many as many as possible like von neumann probes the, the von neumann probes are a, a, a fascinating concept and we uh, we did have a lot of discussions about uh, you know this kind of mission architecture um towards the beginning the, the fact that we had decided to uh, to make it an inert artifact on um, someone else's mission uh, you know, was was one of the reasons that we we abandoned that particular direction. But the the other uh, reason is that we wanted it to be something that could be built today. And uh, you know, as, as much fun as it would be to to try, uh, we can't build von Neumann probes yet. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Soon into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Also, just a, a note on the von Neumann probe idea is that there's some ethical considerations to having self-replicating probes going out there that maybe we thought we had enough ethical <laughs> quandaries to deal with with just creating the message. We were like, uh, should we start seeding interstellar space with self-replicating AI that is going to go and like search for our habitable planets or whatever? I mean, you could really get in deep with it, but we really want to just focus on the core of the message and an artifact we can create with current mission architectures or at least mission architectures that are being proposed right now. But I think the possibilities for these kinds of probes and for chipsats or, or nanosats in the future, it's, it's really exciting. And maybe that could be a, a direction for future consideration. And this will be the first iteration because as society evolves as much faster than ever before and technology evolve also faster than ever before uh, we will have to do iteration of our message each year you know uh, the golden recon 1.0 is, is 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 obsolete right now uh, for t uh, technological and society standard of 2021 and this is not so this, so this was just 44 44 years ago no centuries ago and um, the idea of the project is to make new iteration each year using an open call for science, using open science. We don't want to keep this project for ourselves. We want teams around the world to make this project their own project and to give it to humanity, not keep it by us for ourselves, because this, we know this is a project bigger than we are as a team. And also, this is a bigger a project, bigger uh, uh, than we are the civilization, because it will last after we disappear. So, if technology evolves, if we are able to send um, millions of nanoprobes, if we can, we decide finally to use electromagnetic wave. It doesn't change anything. So, it doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. We just provide a framework that we evolve through time. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I used to look at the Disney. I'm still a big fan of Disney movies. The first time I saw uh, my first Disney, I, I, I saw it on VHS. And when I saw it again, when I was a teenager, it was on TVD. And five years ago, when I, I bought an HD TV, I, I, I bought them again on Blu-ray. And now I can watch them in 4K on, Net, on Netflix. But the movie is still the same. The emotion is still the same. The message is still the same. Is there any applications that 
you had used in this process of thinking through the eternal echo that can be applied back here today on Earth? Uh, what 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 have we learned from this process, and how could we kind of shape that towards helping Earthlings right now? So. Anything that helps us think about ourselves and our, our place in the universe and what it means to be human, what we're doing to our planet and how our species might exist in more galactic timescales. I think that's a very positive exercise. You know, we all get so caught up in our, our daily lives, like, oh, what am I going to have for breakfast? So what job am I going to have in five years? You know, really, when you start thinking about creating a message that's going to be found by extraterrestrials in a hundred million years, all these little things start to melt away and you realize, oh, you know, we're all kind of on this rock together. We're all just kind of searching for these very basic answers. Like, are we, are we alone? Is this it? Or are there other beings on other rocks thousands of light years away having these exact same discussions? And I think that's extremely humbling. And I definitely think it's a productive, productive discussion. Yeah, if, if I may, I've got a little bit to add. Um, so we... When working out how we were going to do this project, we realized reasonably quickly that there are two very different audiences. There's the the, the target audience, the extraterrestrial intelligences that you know, we're hoping at some point in the distant future we'll be able to pick this thing up in flight and extract the information and go, what a quaint little world that is. Uh, but then there's the uh, that, that the possibility of that happening is is vanishingly small. The audience that we know is going to to look at this, and the audience that you know is already looking at this, is you guys and us and the rest of humanity. You know, th this is, this is a an exercise in you know self reflection on what it means to be human and what you know what humanity values and you know what we do well and what we don't do well, and you know in a in a period of you know, crisis like we're in at the moment, you know, with the, the pandemic and global warming and you know, all the rest, it's a good time to be thinking these things and asking these questions and, you know, trying to work out, you know, what, what we actually want to be. As uh, one of our good friends, David, in uh, the SSP and part of our project would say, uh, we are the universe looking back at itself and now we're creating the, the universe putting out its idea of itself into the universe. And uh, there's just something kind of wonderful and brilliant about that. So or it's creepy. definitely... <laughs> or it's creepy, <laughs> however you want to <laughs> view it. Yeah. Yeah. The inception of a real inception at the end of the day, right? I know um, there are some people who think sending a message and uh, having a really good map and pinpointing where we are exactly in the universe is a bad idea. Did you guys take that into consideration? We did, absolutely. Um, there are very good reasons to to be you know, dubious about whether we should be giving you know, giving our home address to strangers. These reasons are, you know, are are all reasonably well established, so I won't go into the details. But uh, the arguments that we uh, mainly sort of fell behind uh, when it came here uh, is that uh, this this artifact attached to a, an interstellar probe launched from the earth you know today um, is going to uh, you know, have a, a maximum velocity that you know means that it's it is tens of millions of years likely before it gets anywhere you know, near any other kinds of you know star systems if there is any intelligent species closer than that to us already that has a, a malicious intent uh, and the technology to receive the probe they're already hearing our radio transmissions they already know that we're here and if they had the ability to wipe us out they already would have i continue to think about the sh involvement of the larger crowd that would be able to provide to this project you know um uh, how does that look like i know there's a potential of converting this into a civil science program uh, you know how would this look like this is just my personal opinion that nowadays there's a real problem real problem with science um let, let me clarify this um most papers 
and most article, you have to pay to access them. And the citizens can have access to, to those papers. And when we have, to, we have to pay to access the source of knowledge, you can have real problem in society. And most of, I would say, modern um, problems of modern society are due, are due to lack of scientific knowledge and lack to access to scientific information. This is the first step to do some open science, not to keep it for ourselves and you don't have to pay for it. This is public. Giving this to the public is the first step. Then we, we, I don't think we need to invent something complex like blockchain to go to, into blockchain. You got many open science platform, uh, nowadays that can, and, and we key are some of them and GitHub can be used to projects that are not directly related to, to software programming. So we see it as a software project. This is not something solid, something that can't move. This is something that is very fluid, fluid and have to evolve through time. So this is exactly why we don't want to keep it but for ourselves and we want people all around the world to improve it. And also that we want them to correct our bias. We are full of bias. We know that we are all very European centric. We know that we are all kind of, um, into science and tech space stuff. So maybe we are too much enthusiastic and we will need people to do all the all done. This, what you are doing is about to be dangerous and not good. And we want to, we want to listen to critics. This is, this is exactly how we see open science, something we want to engage the public and space. Uh, I, I, I was with friends, um, two days ago and they were like, oh, and I said, oh, this is ISS, yeah, the ISS passing through sky. And they were like, okay, why don't we care about problem on, on, on earth before sending things through space? But what they didn't know is that, is that, um, we are actually trying to cure cancer using 3D, 3D growing cells, uh, cancer cells in tumor cells in space. Um, and many applications come through space and we need to engage the public, um, with space. And this is exactly what we hope to do with this project. So are you guys actually going to build this thing and, and send it out somewhere at some point in some time? Yes. Yes, we will. And we want to. Um, that's exactly the reason why we didn't want to do science fiction. We are all passionate by science fiction. And we know that science fiction drives science and a movie like 2001, the space odyssey shows that you get tablets on it. You get AI on it. You get uh, space travel, planetary travel on it. So, and it has been a lot. You, you, you just have to see the inside of a dragon, uh, spacecraft to, to be convinced by that. Um, but, um, also we are a little selfish. So we wanted to see this project happens during our lives. So if somebody hear us and have millions to spend to a project bigger than himself or herself, if a space agency would want to engage the public, we have a framework. We want science to be the main thing um, for um, a spacecraft going in outer space uh, outside the solar system and the payload just a way to say to all humanity that we are together, that we can send uh, uh, dust in the universe, a little machine thing that we exist and maybe more that we existed because we are quite sure that nobody or nothing will find a message until millions of years. So yes, to answer your question, we want this to happen during our lifetime. And we are all convinced that this is absolutely feasible in the next dozens of years. Well, it's definitely going to lead in very positive and very adventurous directions, I imagine. So our team hopes that we can continue this project and uh, inspire the future generations to not only have eternal echo 
but Eternal Echo 0.1, Golden Record 3.0, and and just many more, essentially. Just keep it moving, right? Yeah, because we need more inspiration and we need more uh, more reflection and passion to move forward in space. And uh, hence why we're here at Space Forward. So, uh, Usain, Kelly, Matthias, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. We're going to keep looking forward. Yeah, thanks very much. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Definitely has been. Some heady stuff for us to ponder. Indeed. So now we wanted to share our own little discovery um, that we came across while doing research for this episode. Uh, So Hussein, what did you find interesting or your golden nugget or golden record? Well, definitely. I like the idea about open source science. So I'm going to share with our listeners that anyone can go to International Space University's website and find within their library the research papers from all the team projects since 1988. Uh, There's Earth's Eternal Echo from last year and papers about agriculture on Mars, a flyby mission to Proxima Centauri and using space technologies to clean up our oceans. Yeah, lots of in-depth information for free. And what about you, Kelly? What's your find? Well, I was definitely blown away by the artwork of Pablo Carlos Budasi. He created this um, logarithmic vision of the observable universe from Earth all the way to the Big Bang. And it's kind of this one big image that represents all of space time as we know it. And it's pretty gorgeous as well as humbling. So what's next, Hussein? Yeah, our next episode is one of my favorite topics, geoinformatics and remote sensing. Uh, Who's that with? With Dr. Thomas Bleschke. He's a professor at University of Salzburg. Okay, great. I guess that's episode uh, 14. Very excited for that. But now what we've all been waiting for is our songs for the new golden record or the theoretical new golden record. And our wonderful listeners shared some songs. Why don't you tell us? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I will. Um, I love this one. This was probably my favorite. Galaxy Song. By Monty Python, which appears in the film The Meaning of Life. Fantastic song. And that was brought to you by Guillermo Joaquin, who is a researcher at the Marie Curie Early Stage Research in System Aspects of Reusable Launchers uh, for the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Yeah. And uh, another song was the soundtrack from Prey. And this was sent to us by Lena Serkovich. She's a senior research fellow at Max Planck Institute in Luxembourg for procedural law. Her research focuses on legal systems related to indigenous rights, extractive industries, and outer space. Excellent. Hey, have you seen Prey, by the way? No, I haven't. Uh, I did. I've never seen Predator, but what an interesting franchise. Definitely worth checking it out if you like sci-fi and aliens and... uh, Crazy stuff. Anyhow, uh, next song up is Only Home I've Ever Known by the California Honey Drops. Um, And that was brought to you by Chris Richardson. He is a EU-US liaison for NanoRacks. And what's really cool about this one is um, that song was actually voted by a group of people who, I guess, co-work at AR House of LA. uh, And they do a lot of like VR, I don't know, high-tech, interesting visual stuff. So um, thanks, folks, for voted on a song. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate it. And the next one is actually by um, someone that I can really call a friend, Kristen Rosignac from the Canadian Space Agency. She told us that there are actually a full, a few, <laughs> not a foo, a few moon play, moon theme playlists by the Canadian Space Agency. Now that's cool. Yeah, very cool. I think there was one, uh, oh gosh, uh, Morrison, Van Morrison, Something, something, something. (laughs) You know that title? (laughs) Uh, I can't think of it. Okay. Um, Last but not least, um, this might ring a bell for you. Lyrics go like this. It took too long to get this high off the ground. You might not ever come down. Well, I know that one, but why don't you tell us? <laughs> okay, that is from um, Stephen Eske, who is the principal of Eaton Elementary in Washington, D.C., and the song is Come Down by Anderson Pack. Awesome song, right? The one and only. 
Cool, guys. Well, thanks for uh, joining us for another episode, and we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Toodaloo for now. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Space Forward, brought to you by Matthias Frenzel, Hussein Bakari, and me, Kelly Kowalski. Follow us on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. Yeah, podcast. Ah. <laughs>